Hola, hi. Thanks for tuning in. I'm excited to unpack some insights with you today on the amazing lexical contribution that indigenous languages have contributed to many different languages around the world. I'm going to be code switching between English and Spanish porque el enfoque de esta charla es las, los idiomas indígenas de América Latina, but you can follow the subtitles throughout in English. Firstly, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Emily and I am the Languages Manager at Language Learning Company, you talk. I have always been passionate about languages and finding links between different languages. I love finding out about calcs and cognates. And I have to say, this really helped me to pick up Spanish fast after having learned French. Even if I did fall into the hands of some false friends along the way. I spent some time living in France and Spain. And I loved seeing the parallels with French and Spanish and Catalan, Galician, Occitan, etc. It was really fun for me to notice the parallels and the links between them. But I always wondered about other languages which were further afield and which looked m more different between them. I wondered if there could be some links there despite the fact that they looked very different. Y pues también viajé por América Latina y esta era la primera vez que encontré personas indígenas y escuché a sus idiomas. Sin duda, esta experiencia de encontrar nueva gente me enriquece uh, culturalmente y también lingüísticamente. ¿Sabías que hay un montón de palabras en español que venían de uh, los idiomas indígenas de América Latina? Pues no solo han entrado en español, se puede encontrar sus raíces por casi todos los idiomas del mundo entero. Increíble. Unfortunately, we can't be together in Mexico today, but we can discover some insights that one of their indigenous languages have enriched us all with, Nahuatl. Let's take the humble tomato, which has made its way into so many staple foods in the West. Imagine a world without pizza, tomato salad, or ketchup. Well, if it wasn't for the Aztecs, the tomato might never have made its way into your language or your life. Los vínculos entre la palabra original de náhuatl, tomac, son innegables a través del mundo. Desde el árabe, tamatem, a la traducción indonesia, tomat, y el islandés, tomatar, es evidente que muchos, muchos idiomas han sido influenciados por náhuatl. Unos idiomas por las cuales no existen exactamente el sonido T han adoptado una palabra que, una palabra que parece mucho a tomar. Por ejemplo, tenemos domasteler en turco, domati en macedonio y domates en griego que favorecen la letra D en lugar de la letra T. De manera similar, podéis ver que en algunos casos la escritura varía. Por ejemplo, el cambio de la primera vocal, O por U, E o I, pero de todas maneras se ve claramente la semejanza con el náhuatl. Let's break down the etymology. Tomac comes from the náhuatl, tomoac, which roughly translates as roundness or swelling. And ak at the end means water. Makes sense, right? This vegetable, or is it a fruit, made its way to the new world in the early 17th century when the early explorers who ventured to the Americas took some back with them to their homelands. 
bringing their Aztec designated name with them. Although they only gained popularity outside of the Americas three centuries later, supposedly thanks to the invention of pizza. So we owe those Aztecs a lot. Whilst tomatoes are relatively easy to transport to new countries and grow across different climates, papayas, however, were not. This didn't stop the original Taino word from spreading the world over too, though. Tal como el tomate, la papaya es nativo de América Latina y tiene muchos beneficios de salud. Quizás sea la razón por la cual este fruta sea tan popular por el mundo entero. La palabra original viene de Taíno, que era una lengua del Caribe, específicamente de Puerto Rico, pero que ya no se habla. Creo que sería más rápido si os diera los idiomas que no se les parecen a la palabra Taíno que es que sí, porque hay tantas que se escribe casi igual que la palabra, que esta palabra papaya de Taino. Uh, como podéis ver aquí, que se usa para referir a esta fruta tropical, pues la palabra es casi igual desde Armenia a Zambia y a la India. Es increíble. Pues a veces reemplaza la vocal I, a Y o J depende de las tendencias del idioma, pero el sonido es más o menos igual para todos, no importa el continente. Moving back to Mexico and to another food that is slightly less beneficial for your health than the papaya, but equally as beneficial to your happiness, chocolate. Here, we have the Nahuatl word for chocolate, pronounced zocolac. Whilst the original zocolac from Mexico would probably have looked more like a mixture of cocoa beans and hot water, not quite the chocolate we all know and love today, the linguistic legacy of the Aztecs lives on. Certainly across European languages like French, Spanish, German, etc., we can see a lot of similarities. And we know that this is thanks to the Nahuatl word. Rather like the universally understood travel essentials, yes, no, taxi, and pizza, the word for chocolate is pretty much international and universally understood as well. We can trace the commencement of the various translations that have this common ch sound, followed by a combination of letters that makes a sound like col afterwards. This comes from the original word for uh, cocoa beans, or the original word for cocoa, which refers to the cocoa beans that chocolate is made from. In fact, the Nahuatl, in the Nahuatl language, zocolac literally meant food from cocoa beans. Logical. Variations of the name chocolate and its component meanings can be evidenced throughout Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And you can see some examples here. For example, we have zocolate in Filipino, calculi in Mandarin, and chocolate in Arabic. Aquí está otra palabra de Nahuatl. ¿Alguien puede adivinar lo que significa en su idioma nativo? Correcto, la planta picante. Esta próxima diapositiva nos da una impresión del alcante de esta especie que guardó su nombre original de Nahuatl en una amplia gama de idiomas. Aquí está. Notamos el sonido de CHE con el sonido I que sigue en un gran nombre de idiomas a través del mundo. Para mí, lo que fuera el más sorprendente era cómo se le entraba a Sarmi del Sur, Kazakh, Kachi y Tagalog. Es gracioso para mí, 
porque en Asia les encanta la comida picante. Entonces, por eso siempre pensaba que el origen de esta planta, y pues entonces la palabra chili, era de Asia, pero no lo es. Además, el chile no es la única especie que viajó por el mundo durante los siglos 40 y 50. Muchas especies sí venían de Asia. Incluso el jengibre, el curcuma y la canela. Y por eso la verdad es que no es sorprendente que hay vínculos entre las traducciones por esas especies y muchas más a través del mundo. De hecho, el comercio de especias causó un gran intercambio, no solo de product productos comestibles, pero de ideas y de progreso tecnológico entre las culturas del occidente, África y Asia, que lógicamente tuvo un, un impacto enorme sobre la globalización del léxico. One such example is the word canoe. The original word was canoa. Whilst many translations retain the original first letter K, a number shifted to the letter C. A number of the translations here is felt in exactly the same way as the English word. And I think we can conclude from that that there are some calcs or borrowing straight from English, such as we can see in Tagalog, for example. Clearly, the canoe was a very useful invention at the time, although the explorers would obviously have been using something rather more substantial on their travels across the Seven Seas. Es difícil imaginar cómo era el viaje de estos exploradores. La brutalidad de un viaje tan largo y incómodo y las condiciones que tenían que enfrentar para sobrevivir las enfermedades, la escasez de comida y el riesgo de perderse, y las tormentas. Es interesante porque la palabra huracán viene del taíno huracán, que ya sabe viene del Caribe, y esta parte del mundo está especialmente conocido por sus uh, gran tormentas. Sin embargo, es muy posible que esta palabra entró a otros idiomas a través de la variación española, en lugar de transferirse directamente a esos idiomas desde Taíno. Pues aquí vemos que el sonido H no se suena en muchos idiomas, así que muchos de esos ejemplos comienzan con el vocal U o U o F en el caso de gallego pero se les parecen mucho. Let's stick with the Taino language for now, but move back to the theme of international food. Potatoes. A very popular food, especially in Europe, that comes in so many different forms. Not a week goes by when I don't eat some form of a potato, whether that is chips or crisps or roast potatoes. I love it all. I actually even have a vegetable plot in my garden and they grow really well in the UK. So up until recently, I guess I had always assumed that it was a Northern European delicacy. But I was wrong, very wrong. Like the chili pepper, they actually also originally come from Latin America. The first potato plant was originally taken to Europe from the Caribbean during the 16th century. The Taino people, who were native to various Caribbean islands, called this root vegetable batata. Although the Romans at the time decided to call it poma terrestrial in Latin, variants of which did stick for some European languages, such as the French pomme de terre, I was amazed to find that there were a great many translations for this plant the world over with links to the original Taino name for it, from Europe to Asia and beyond. For example, we have batati in Finnish, batates in Arabic, batatla in Uzbek, 
Badala in Sinhala and Beteta in Samarin, as well as Bathamas in Quechua. It's not difficult to see the connections here, and in my opinion, interesting to see which languages favour the post of P sound for the letter B, depending on the phonology of the word, of the language, sorry. <clears throat> De plantas a animales, pero es probable que en aquella época se comió este también, la llama. Hay una cuenta graciosa que explica cómo sucedió su nombre. Pues, supuestamente, cuando llegaron los exploradores españoles, les preguntaron a los nativos cómo se llamaba esta criatura. ¿Cómo se llama? ¿Cómo se llama? Y por qué los nativos no les entendían y que se les preguntaran tantas veces cómo se llama, los nativos siempre repetían la palabra llama a los exploradores. Así que la palabra llama se quedó hasta ahora. No sabemos si es realmente lo que sucedió, pero sí podemos atribuir la palabra llama a quechua. No imagino que se ha importado este animal a tantos países que las otras cosas que ya hemos visto durante esta charla. Al fin y al cabo no se come, al menos no creo que se come hoy en día, pero no lo sé. Y bueno, por eso creo que es curioso, porque vemos las raíces lingüísticas de llama por realmente todo el mundo. Un en uzbeco, tumbuka, japonés, y el más curioso desde mi punto de vista, en Bermano. Uh, aunque en Bermano sea Lama Kalao, que va más allá de la palabra original de Quechua. Pero se ve de todas maneras Lama en Bermano. Pues veamos otros cambios y sustituciones típicas entre los ejemplos que tenemos aquí. Por ejemplo, no existe el sonido L en japonés. Uh, que, se, que se sustituye por la palabra R, uh, la letra R, perdón. Y bueno, en Yoruba han añadido la letra I al comienzo de la palabra. A pesar de estos cambios, es muy fácil ver la influencia que el quechua ha ejercido sobre este y a muchos, muchos más idiomas. No tuve espacio suficiente aquí para nombrar todos. Finally, let's look at one last indigenous language. And, surprise, it's not an indigenous language from Latin America this time. A bonus extra one for you from the land of the Kiwis. The word Kiwi in the English language refers to people who live in New Zealand and the Kiwi bird, which, is, or which was the initial Maori meaning of the word as well as the green egg-shaped fruit. And it's this that we're going to take a quick look into now. Another surprise. The kiwi is actually not native to New Zealand. The story goes that the fruit originally came from China and it only made its way over to New Zealand at the beginning of the 20th century. In fact, The name kiwi only caught on in 1959 and was named as such after New Zealand's national bird. I believe the case of the kiwi goes to show how quickly etymology can move and disseminate, especially now more than ever in today's globalized world. As we can see, this word has been absorbed into a vast range of languages the world over even into Cantonese, despite the fact that the kiwi plant was originally from China in the first place. In Cantonese, they say keiji zhao, and this is the language that furthest deviates from the original Maori kiwi, albeit with some variations, such as the replacement of W for V in some languages, such as Icelandic and Hebrew, and the duplication of the vowel, as is the case with Oromo. Pero, ¿por qué el Nuevo Zelandia alcanzó a una influencia tan grande, dado que no es el único exportador de esta fruta? 
pues simplemente porque producen una cantidad tan amplia de los kiwis. Es enorme. De hecho, el kiwi es la exportación horticola, horticola la más grande de Nueva Zelanda. Y los ingresos que ganan de los kiwis hacen millones de dólares. Entonces, todo considerado, la verdad es que realmente una sorpresa, una sorpresa no lo es. This has just been a tiny snapshot into how indigenous languages of the world have gifted us with things we eat, things we use to help us that we take for granted, animals we love, and so, so many other parts of our day to day. Indigenous languages account for almost two thirds of the world's 7,000 languages, and I could talk about their contribution to global lexicon for days but you'll have to wait until the next Polyglot Conference in Cholula to find out more from me. In the meantime, if you would like to learn some indigenous languages, you can check out the Utalk app at utalk.com slash app, and you will see all of the indigenous languages that we have there on offer on our website. What's more, for us polyglots, I believe that it's well worth looking out for these semantic connections because the more links that you are able to make between languages, the easier it becomes to pick them up and retain new vocabulary. So thanks for tuning in and happy language learning. Bye.